And again, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. I've had a great time. For those of you that have had a part in preparing the meals before the services, thank you. And uh, last night, I think I got a little extra big uh, scoop of lasagna. I was especially grateful for that, you know. And tonight, I was able to go back in there and, and uh, eat and enjoy some fellowship with you. And, and uh, I'm grateful for what it is the Lord's doing in this place. And, and uh, I thank the Lord for my brother, his influence on my life. And in addition to being brothers, we're friends. And we love spending time with one another. And what I find that we talk about more than anything else is just the work that the Lord's doing in our respective lives, our thankfulness for it, and our desire to see more done for the Lord. And so I was grateful to share some time with him today. And uh, my prayers are with you here. I, I am so grateful for what it is that God's doing in this place. And I know that uh, many great days lie ahead. And I want to encourage you to just... Press on for the Lord. Be faithful. Uh, don't be a thin-skinned Christian. Don't be that one that's always easily offended over this or that. I kind of like that verse that says, uh, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You know, Just be a faithful, steady Christian. And uh, I hope that uh, in, in the future, if the Lord allows me to come back, I see you here. And, and uh, I think it would be wonderful with the short time that we do have left if we would just be consistent and faithful in our service for God. And so thank you so much for letting me be here. And uh, I'm looking forward to you also having a chance to hear more from the Sharp family in the uh, days and, and uh, nights, uh, tomorrow night, I guess, and, and Sunday upcoming. And uh, you want me to find her family. Many of you know that already. And uh, they're wonderful, wonderful people. And uh, you know of the work they've done here in this church. And we could tell a similar story of how they just came and served and helped. And uh, you'll do yourself a great favor by being here tomorrow to hear the message that the Lord's laid on Brother Sharp's heart. I know he'll encourage you in that way. If you have your Bibles handy tonight, let's go to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And we just heard a beautiful song sung very well about the reality that people need the Lord. And that, in essence, is what missions is all about. Last night, we opened the Bible and we, we asked a question that, that James asked about, about the nature of our lives. What is our life? And we discovered that our life is something that is to be lived in accordance with God's will. We're to seek to glorify the Lord. And tonight I want us to look at a little bit more practical aspect and, and uh, I want us to discover how it is that we can use our life, not just the duration as we talked about, but the donation. I want us to consider how can we participate in God's work practically in this matter of giving so that more people can hear the gospel message. We heard of radio stations, we've heard of churches being planted and, and the need for the gospel to be preached and in a very real sense we have to think of the material. Now by material I'm not saying that it's not spiritual because I believe in the life of a Christian there is no such thing as the, sac uh, the sacred and the secular or the, the Christian part and then the non-Christian part. I think that everything we do in our lives should be done to please God. It should be done to give glory to Him. And so we're going to talk tonight about, about a topic that sometimes is a little bit taboo and it should not be. We're going to talk about this matter of money, of finances. Now if you went to the doctor for a checkup and he started poking around at you and, and he poked you in your abdomen somewhere and, and you winced in pain, that would tell the doctor something. It would tell the doctor that you have a problem and that he put his finger on the problem. And sometimes when we come to this topic of finances, when, when the Holy Spirit takes the message and, and, and He begins to apply it to our heart, we, we wince in pain a little bit. And if that's the case tonight as we go through this text, let's thank God that He loves us enough to do that work of a physician to help us see where there's a problem and to find the remedy as we work together. Now, we know that money can do strange things to people. I remember watching the news and I was so amazed some time ago as Martha Stewart for a measly couple hundred thousand dollars went to prison. Now you'd say a measly couple hundred thousand dollars. She was worth over a billion dollars when that happened. Money makes people do strange things. And most of us spend at least a third of our life working for money. We spend time spending money. And we spend time thinking about money, budgeting for money. So much of our life is taken up with this matter of our finances. I heard of a college student at West Virginia University who put this on his answering machine. He said, if you're from the phone company, the money is in the mail. 
If you're one of my parents, send money. If it is my financial institution, you don't lend enough money. If you're my friend, you owe me money. If you're a female, I have plenty of money, you know. And uh, he kind of figured it out that everybody's thinking about finances. And if there's any doubt about it, let's put it to rest. Money takes up a major part of our lives. That is why Jesus Christ talks so much about finances. It is so close to us. It is so connected to us. We oftentimes make the mistake of finding our personal value wrapped up in our financial portfolio. Of the 29 parables that Jesus gave, 16 of them deal directly with money. And so much of what the Apostle Paul wrote dealt with finances. And the book of Philippians is a book written by the Apostle Paul. And I want us to see what it is that the Holy Spirit of God inspired him to write that I believe was written, yes, to the believers at Philippi, but to the believers at Freeway, so we can be helped and encouraged tonight. If you're able, I'm going to invite you to join me in standing for the reading of God's Word tonight. And we're going to look to Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse 13. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. If you're glad that verse is in the Bible, say amen. amen. Oh, I am. What a great verse that is. Verse 14 says, Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but ye only. Now I'm going to read on, but the Apostle Paul's used a word twice already. It's the word communicated. We read it in verse 14. He, he talked about the fact that they communicated with him. In verse 15 he said, again, they communicated with him. And then he defines what communicated means here. It meant that they gave uh, uh, finances to meet the needs that came along in his life as he served the Lord. Let's look at verse 16. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. In other words, he said, man, you send offerings again and again to meet my needs. Verse 17, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, in odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to God. In other words, the Apostle Paul said, man, when I got your offering, it smelled good to me and God too. He said, I, I was thankful for it, and I know it was pleasing to God. That's a great thought. Verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory, by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I want you once again, if you would please, to look back to verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches. Now that word according is a word in, in this text that means in proportion to. It, it's, a, it's a comparative term. Paul said that my God's gonna gonna meet all your needs according to, proportionate to His riches. How many of you would agree with me tonight that, that we have a God that abounds in riches? Uh, we've got a wonderful God. And Paul said, as wonderful as our God is, in, in, in proportion to His goodness, you can know that He's going to be meeting needs in your life. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Our Father, we thank and praise you tonight that you are a good, a kind, a loving, a benevolent God. We praise you for your grace. And Lord, we thank you for a wonderful verse in the Bible, like verse 19 in our text, that, that assures us that, that God shall supply all our needs according to, to the riches that are belonging to you and you alone. Lord, I pray that you'd help me tonight. Give me wisdom and clarity. I pray that you would help me to be a blessing to this church family. Lord, I do care deeply and I, I want to be used. Holy Spirit of God, use me. Open up hearts. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This text that we've just read together is a text that has been looked over for more than 200 centuries. 
It's a text that Christians have turned to and they've been encouraged by the truth presented here. It, just think of it. The Bible says, My God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. What a thought. If I were to ask how many tonight would be glad to know that there's a holy God that has all the riches of the universe at His disposal, who's able and willing to bless you and to minister to you in that sense. If I were to ask how many of you think that it would be good to receive that kind of a blessing from God, I think there would be pretty much across the board agreement tonight. I think we would have unity tonight. That's a good thing. That's a wonderful promise. That's an encouraging truth that a good God, a loving God, a kind God, a benevolent God who knows what we need has assured us in His Word that His desire is to meet those needs in proportion to His riches. That's a pretty good promise in the Bible. But as we look at this text, we're going to find that this promise here is presented, is conditioned upon our faith acting out through the venue of giving. The Apostle Paul said that God supplies ironically through giving. The Bible is saying if you have a need, plant a seed, so to speak. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. If you believe the Bible is God's Word, say Amen. amen. And we're going to do our very best to deal with this topic biblically tonight. And, and the Bible is very clear when it says, He which soweth sparingly will reap sparingly. And the whole context of that passage is how we deal with our finances in terms of generosity, of giving to meet the needs of the work of God. God's blessing in this regard is tied to the faith in our giving. If you have a pen tonight, I want you to grab it. And if you have a piece of paper, get it nearby. And we're going to walk through some things together. I'll reference some verses that we won't have the time to go to. I've been told I can preach until the clock's chime to let me know that it's 8 o'clock, all right? And so we got a couple minutes here. But uh, I, I want to I make some points tonight that you can be thinking on and praying about as you make your way through this conference time. As we look to this text, we'll see, first of all, the purpose of giving. The purpose of giving. Let's go back to verse 14 in the text. Paul said this, Notwithstanding, ye have well done. Now we've read through this text, but I just love the fact the Apostle Paul says you've well done. In other words, you did a good job. You did well. You see, they fulfilled the will of God for their lives in this instance. And the Apostle Paul, Apostle meaning a sent out one from Jesus Christ, observe their behavior, their manner, their lifestyle, their decisions, their lavish generosity. And he said, you've done well. Good job. Well done. God's desire is that we, as His people, if you are indeed a believer tonight, that we would be generous people. Luke 6 and verse 38 says this, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You see, the Bible teaches us that we are to be a giving people. This was the nature of the church in the very beginning. Pentecost Sunday came, thousands of Christians are saved, many of them are visiting from around the world, but when they accept Christ in Jerusalem, they make the decision, man, I'm going to stay right here, I want to learn more about what it is to be a follower of Christ, and many of them were shunned by their families, they lost their livelihood, and those first century believers said, listen, let's give lavishly, generously to see that this new entity as it's been empowered by the Spirit of God is able to move forward. They gave so that the work could be established. Acts 4 verses 32 and 35 says, The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the price of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, 
and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now, I, I don't believe that what we're reading in the text there was speaking of a communal lifestyle. It was a unique moment. It was a special time. But what happened there, as unique as it was, the generosity, the compassion, the willingness to participate in the work of God, I don't think that should be an anomaly at all. These were free gifts. These were offerings. In fact, if we were to have taken the time to read a couple verses further, we'd meet a great man in Scripture who was a real encourager. That's what his name meant. A man by the name of Barnabas. And the Bible tells us that he was a Levite living on the island of Cyprus. And what I've discerned about these people living in that place at that time, Barnabas being a Levite was not permitted to own land. Yet the Bible says, having land, he sold it and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. In other words, what the law could never legislate that he would do when the grace of God began to work in his heart he was more than happy to do so that the work of God could go forward you see as he began to grow in the Lord he no longer looked at things in terms of there's your 10% God and this is mine he said all of its gods what would be the very best use of these resources so that the work of God can go forward think of that we give to be obedient to the Lord. We give to do well. And conversely, when we don't give, if we're miserly, we're not doing well. Malachi 3 and verse 8 says, Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? I don't know about you, but I certainly don't want to live a life that is perceived from God's vantage point as being a, a life that is not a generous life, even a miserly life. A life that doesn't demonstrate a concern, a compassion for the billions in our world who do not know who Jesus Christ is. I've discovered that many people think when they sometimes hear of giving and finances, oh, they're just trying to make me give. The word make and give, they can't go together in the same context. That's like people say sometimes, well, that sermon made me feel guilty. Could it be that you were guilty? And the sermon revealed something? You know, I think most pastors understand, and I know there are those radical extremes, mind control and weirdos and all the rest, and, and I, I know there are the radical extreme occasions, but, but most of the time pastors are pretty aware that really all we can do is just teach the truth and pray that the Holy Spirit of God would move in the hearts of people. I heard of one pastor that, that really needed to get the offerings up, and so he planted in all the seats a little electronic charges, and, and he said, folks, tonight we're going to be taking pledges so so that people can commit to give weekly above what they're giving now and he said all that will give twenty dollars stand up and then he hit the charge and they all got a shock right in the seat of the pants you know some of them jumped up but not all of them and, and so he got on the phone to the guys in the back and said turn, turn the uh, voltage up you know and, and he kept going and going at the end of the night they're counting these pledges as people stood up and, and uh, they said well the good news is the pledges really went well best we've ever done as a church the bad news is you actually electrocuted some people they've died you know some people just aren't going to be made to give in that sense I want you to realize the, the purpose of it all is because we love Jesus Christ and we want to give so that his work can be done we want to do well from his perspective when we give let us know that in the truest sense we're not giving to a need Amen. there's nothing less motivating to me than well we really we got we got some big needs you know no we're giving to Jesus Christ it's an opportunity it's a joy it's a privilege we see the purpose of giving if you love Jesus tonight say amen, amen. All right, make sure you're still awake, all right? And, and uh, I want us to move on to this text and, and see not only the purpose of giving, but the progress by giving. The progress. Verses 15 and 16. The Apostle Paul says, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no search, uh, church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. So we find Paul departing, needs being met. Verse 16, for even in Thessalonica, here he is, uh, arriving at a new destination. He sent once and again unto my necessity. I, I want you to see that Paul here makes the mention of the fact that the Philippian believers communicated with him through their giving. They met his needs so that God work 
could go forward. These Christians, they gave sacrificially so that God's work could be carried to places where it had not gone before. So that God's man, in this case, the Apostle Paul, could have the liberty to go and to meet that need. Oh, listen, friends, I want you to know what a great joy is ours when we give and see progress within the context of the work of God. God is not pushy in this regard. Uh, he's not legislating this. But as God works in our hearts, as we grow in the Lord, we begin to see the, the prospect of His work marching forward. Let me paint a different picture for you for a moment. What if God's work doesn't? What if we come together as a church, as has been said so eloquently already this week, and we have a church meeting and say, what are we going to do for worldwide missions? And we say, nothing. Nothing's changing in my life. I'm not going to do one bit more. I'm not interested in God's work going forward. Well, we know it's not static. If it's not going forward in, in our area, if we make a decision that we will not be the hands, the feet, the, 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 the voice of Christ in our region, uh, another influence will grow. What do you think our world will look like in a generation's time if Christians made a determination that we're not going to care enough to do anything to reach out to others? You see, we understand the value of God's work going forward. It progresses as, as we give and in so many ways. There are a lot of great examples of this, I'm sure. But I remember when my wife and I uh, moved from Tennessee to uh, where we are now in San Diego County in, in, in Oceanside, and we moved there to get the work started. God laid it on our hearts. We knew about it. And, and it was as though the Holy Spirit of God challenged us. There's a need. And what are you going to do about it? And we felt the Lord was calling us in a special way to leave a position there on a staff in a great environment and go to a place where there really was no church that believed like our churches do. We had a little money in savings. We were getting ready to buy a house. We had two cars. We figured we, we could do fine with, with just one. So we sold one of them. We took the money and that gave us what we needed to rent a moving truck and to begin to make our way. And, and we, we gave personally at that time in that way and, and the work began to progress. Now it wasn't sufficient to get all the way. Along the way, there were churches that, that said, we'll support you for a time as you get started. They gave a little more, and the work was able to progress a little more down the road. After that, our church began to grow, and the church family began to give, and the Lord blessed. And, and, and we know that people uh, are attending Coastline right now because of some of those earliest gifts, and some of the churches that supported, and some of those earliest attenders because of their giving. But I'll never forget that first March 26th when our church got together and uh, we had an opportunity to have a very special banquet. We called it the From the Heart Banquet. And I remember as our, as our church was, was just really months old at that time, gathering about 104 people together and, and saying to them, we have an opportunity to buy a building. I, I don't know if it's going to work out or not, but this much I do know, we've got to go for it. We've got to swing for the fences here. And, and we began to see the vision of, of a church working together, people giving sacrificially. And we knew it wasn't about a building. Nothing about a building is exciting. Buildings require maintenance. You've got to fix them up. You've got to clean them. What excited us and thrilled us was what was going to happen inside the building. That was men and women and boys and girls coming in. And I remember that night as our church was so very young, people coming together. We needed $50,000 to complete what we needed for a down payment. And God gave us that night over $53,000. Listen, here's what I'm saying. People gave and the church progressed. The work went forward. Oh, I don't know on the continuum of where everybody came in. We had the privilege as a family of, of being among the first to give. And we've continued. Some came in a little bit along the way. Others a little bit more along the way. But as Christians were faithful to give, it paid it forward for those yet to be reached. Paul's work went forward because these believers gave. It's just that simple. That's what the Bible says. He said, man, you gave to meet my needs so that I could make these missionary journeys. Progress in the work of God comes through giving of our time, of our talent, of our treasure. What a great thought. Isn't God so wonderful to let us be co-laborers together with Him? He lets us do this, friends. It's a joy. As we move on in this text, we'll see the product of giving. 
verse 17. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Oh, what a, what a statement Paul makes here. He says, you know, I'm not encouraging you to, to give so that uh, I can get the gift. He said, really, I want fruit to abound to your account. That tells me something. People of faith have an account. And that account is maybe not in a bank right here on earth. I want to ask you today, how are your investments going? How are your investments going? I don't know if you have a lot of investments or little investments, but, but this much I know, we're living in really bizarre economic times. I had a guy not too long ago uh, share with me some words to a song. You may know the song, All to Jesus I Surrender, All to Him I Freely Give. I will ever love and trust Him. Maybe you've heard that song. Hear the words of the song He gave me. All to Dow Jones I surrender, all to it I sadly give. I will ever watch and worry in its presence daily live. I surrender all. And for a lot of people, that's how they view their investments. Oh, they look at, at the, at the uh, uh, financial news and when it goes down, they grieve. And when it goes up, they cheer and, and they're on a roller coaster. Investing is a frightening thing. In 1999, if you'd invested $10,000 in WorldCom, you would have lost 99.75% of your investment. The good news is you could still make fun of people that invested in that same year the same amount in Enron. They lost 100% of their investment. And so I'm asking you tonight, how are your investments going? Matthew 6.19 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Just for fun. Just for fun tonight, all right? Because we want to have fun. Let's say that you invested $10,000 in Freeway Baptist Church. Amen. Just for fun, what would that investment look like? Well, if you're in a 15% tax bracket, your itemized deductions would have immediately saved you $1,800 on your combined state and federal taxes. Think of that. If, if, if you're uh, in a 28% tax bracket, you would have saved 3100 on your taxes. That's a 31% return. Not bad on an investment. But some of you are thinking, well, that's just ridiculous. You can't evaluate spiritual giving in terms of a return like that. And I would say, you're right. What would an investment in Freeway Baptist Church in these recent years look like on a graph? And I'm going to tell you something it would look nothing like those graphs that illustrate what's happened on Wall Street. It'd be a graph straight up. It'd be a graph telling the story of people who've come to know Jesus Christ, who've been baptized, who are being discipled. It, that graph would tell the story of, of marriages being strengthened and, and people being reunited who are separated. It'd talk about the return of a wayward child. It would talk about the help of the grieving. It would talk about those that the world would say are down and out, who, who've been encouraged, who've come along. Listen, friends, the point I'm making is that when we invest in the spiritual things, we're always a winner in that sense. Matthew 6, 20 says, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth, doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. I read the first part of that verse earlier and it was in the negative sense and in the positive sense. It says don't put your money where you know in time it's going to be lost, it's going to erode, it's going to be stolen, but rather think of the spiritual things. You see, you make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. What kind of life are you making? Faith giving is the greatest life there is. As we move on in our study tonight, we'll see the principle through giving. Let's look at verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now we began our study by considering really one of the great verses in the Bible. A great promise. We've seen that God promises to supply... But I want you to notice how verse 19 begins. It's a little tiny conjunction there. It's the word but. In other words, if you're a writer and you use that little conjunction, you're letting people know that it's a conditioned expression, that a change has been made. And, and Paul writes all these things and he says, but, but my God shall supply your needs. The principle here is that God blesses us in proportion to our faith. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 29 in the Bible, God's holy word says this, According to your faith, be it unto you. In proportion to your faith, 
be it unto you. Our blessing comes as we believe. I've often wondered why the greatest work in all of the world, the work of God, is a work that so profoundly is underfunded and in needs of people who will be willing to go and serve and so forth. In 2000, an exhaustive survey was done. The study revealed that only 8% of believers faithfully give to the work of God every week. Now, friends, I'm the furthest thing from a legalist, and, and your, your pastor certainly wouldn't be that either. But Christianity 101 tells us that we're to live for the things of God. We're to be faithful, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, uh, 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 concerning this matter of an offering on the first day of the week. We're to, we're to lay by Him in store as God has prospered us. All of us can't give the same amount. That is not what God has asked. That wouldn't even be reasonable. But all of us can give proportionately. We can all do something. And so we see the principle through giving. God can meet every need that you and I have and every need that our churches have as we are faithful in our giving to Him. My brother mentioned that in the midst of acquiring property and so forth that we've given more to missions. Listen, we've literally had times as a church where we've said we've got some real financial needs in our church. We better take on some more missionaries. Amen. Now I know that is just absolutely backwards to the thinking of many people but so much of what we find in God's economy is backwards to our way of thinking. God's way of up is down. The, uh, you know, the way to lead is to serve. And, and so much of this, it doesn't make any sense to the carnal Christian or to the unregenerate person, the unsaved person. But to people of the Word, we understand that God is honored when we live by faith. You see, God honors faith because faith honors God. Think of that. It works like this. I shovel it out, God shovels it in. I shovel it out, God shovels it in. God has a bigger shovel. That's how it works. Now, I'm not a name it, claim it preacher. I'm not saying today that God will always reward our faithfulness in giving with money. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I am saying as we honor God with our lives, He'll honor our life. As a parent seeing a child who's who's obeying and, and loving and caring. They're going to find pleasure there. I want you to know that as we're responsible and faithful with the blessings that God gives us, He'll say, there's someone who I can use in a special way. Your life will be blessed. Did you know God has not given you one blessing that He wants you to hold on at the expense of sharing with others? Not one. God doesn't give people stuff so they can hold on to it. He gives people stuff so they can use what He's given them. And everything that God places in our life, it's with the kingdom in mind. So we can use it in the life to which God has called us. I like the story of the boy and his mom. They were in a store and, and uh, the boy was behaving well. And, and the man behind the counter asked the little boy, Would you like some candy? He had a jar of candy. And, and the boy said yes. And he said, Well, reach in there and get some. The boy didn't do it. He just stood there. And the man said, go ahead, reach in there and get some. The little boy didn't do it. So finally, the man behind the counter reached in there and he got some candy and he filled the boy's hands up and the boy's stuffed it in his pockets, you know. And as the boy and his mom left the store that day, the mom said, why didn't you reach in there and get the candy? The man told you twice you could do that. He said, that man has bigger hands than I do. <laughs> you know? We think we're so clever with our little hands. Our Father has a lot bigger hands than we do. I wonder tonight, do you believe? I wonder tonight, do you have faith enough to trust God's plan for bringing His blessings to a church, to a life? Malachi 3 tenths is bringing all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat to eat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. There may be someone who could say, well, that's a text in the Old Testament. I understand that, but I believe the principle, which is what we're considering, applies. And I also find that that's not a promise really to any single person. And principle and application can be made. But when the Bible says there, bring ye, ye, that's that southern word, you all. You all. 
The question is this, I wonder what would happen at Freeway Baptist Church if you all decided to live a life of lavish generosity to the things of God. If everybody said, I wonder how I can possibly do more to extend the message further. I wonder what would happen. The Bible in Matthew 6, 4 says, That thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. The Bible says when we're doing our giving in that sense, we're not to make a big display about what we've given. But the Bible says that as we give in appropriate times and appropriate ways, that God, He sees it all. And the Bible says that He wants to reward. God, I believe, wants to bless some lives and churches. And yet it's tied to our faith. And tonight as we've gone through this passage, I want us to think in relationship to our giving by faith I get periodicals across my desk and sometimes I have no idea how they got there I read one a while back and usually I just look at the pictures see what's going on but this one had interesting pictures and when I started reading the article I couldn't stop it told me about a church in Thailand in an area called Chiang Mai a church that has 400 members A church that has 400 members that not only tithe every single week, but give above that for the furtherance of the gospel work. It told of people that make a weekly wage of 40 stangs, which is less than 20 cents. That's their weekly wage. It told me of a church where everybody gave based on what they made and and from their meager existence and their relatively small offerings, they were able to support a pastor who in a full-time way could serve the congregation. They were able to finance two missionaries from their own church who were able to go out and minister to other people like them. This church of 400 people where everybody gave was a church comprised entirely of lepers. And I had to put down the periodical and say, and and Steve, what's your problem? What's your excuse? Those were people that were just so in love with Jesus Christ. It seemed reasonable to them to live lives as living sacrifices for their God. To just go ahead and put it all on the altar. You say, well, if I lived that way, I would do something foolish. Do you think that low of... God the Father's design for your life and for the furtherance of the gospel in this sense? Oh, listen, I'm saying that as we live for God, we're going to discover that with His wisdom in our lives, He'll find ways to do more with less. There is no telling what God can do through us as we faithfully practice this matter of giving by faith. Tonight, I want to challenge you. I don't, I don't know where you're at right now. I don't, what you're, don't know what you're going through. I wouldn't know who here has much in the way of finances and who here tonight maybe is struggling. That is all irrelevant. I'm talking about God's plan for all of our lives. It includes this matter of giving, of being faithful, of trusting God. I want to challenge you tonight to trust God. Some of you here, that means you're going to begin giving. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. You're getting ready to start on one of the greatest adventures of the Christian life. For some, you've given. It's time to increase, to grow. Doing more than you've done before. That's the challenge tonight. Our Father, we thank you for this opportunity of of, of study. We thank you for this opportunity to open the Bible and learn and grow. Lord, I've sought to do my best to be accurate to the text to share scriptures that back up the reality that I'm not teaching just my view on this, Lord, but I'm seeking to share what it is the Bible has said to us. God, I wonder what would happen if if everyone at Coastline Baptist Church decided to be faithful in giving. I'd imagine needs would be met and more could be done for the work. Lord, I, I wonder tonight what would happen if Freeway Baptist Church became a church like that church in... Thailand we read about where everybody just lived 
to see the work of God go forward. God, help us all to do our part, to follow your will. Find pleasure in, in, in the way we, we give by faith. I pray that as Paul looked at these believers and said they did well, I, I pray that, that uh, from your perspective as, as a father, a heavenly father, that, that you would be well pleased in, in this way. Help us, we pray. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed tonight. In just a few minutes, we'll be on our way. Maybe you're here this evening. You'd say, Pastor, uh, you talked about giving. And uh, maybe you'd say, my desire is to be one of those children to a heavenly father that lives with his work in mind. I don't want to be the steward that buries the talent, as we talked about last night, but rather... I want to be somebody that, that makes the greatest impact my life can possibly make, including in this way. And maybe you're here tonight and you say, and that means I'm going to begin. I'm going to begin to be faithful and consistent, not just a, a little here or there whenever I'm feeling it, but I want to be faithful, consistent. Perhaps you're here you'd say, you know, Pastor, I've given in my Christian life, but, but I believe it's time to grow. I believe it's time to to ask the Lord, would you have me to do more? Maybe you're here tonight, you'd say, Pastor, that's my heart. I want to fulfill the Lord's will in my life in this way. And my heart is open to that. I'm asking the Lord to share with me what it is He would have me to do. Are there those who'd be willing to lift up a hand tonight and say, Pastor, that's where I'm at this evening. I want to be faithful in this matter of being a generous giver. Are there those like that tonight? Hands already been lifted. Are there others? Pastor, that's where I'm at tonight. I want to be faithful in that way numbers of hands. Thank you so much. Maybe you're here tonight and you'd say, Pastor, you talked an awful lot about God's work and people being saved. And, and friend, maybe you're here tonight and you don't know for sure if you were to die this evening that you'd spend eternity in heaven. Well, we know that we never give to gain God's love, to gain acceptance from Him. And we don't give to merit or earn or pay for salvation. That's all been paid for on the cross of Calvary. And maybe you're here tonight, you'd say, Pastor, I'm not certain if I died today, I'd spend eternity in heaven. And I'd like to know that. I'd like to be sure that heaven will be my eternal home. Are there those who'd be willing to lift a hand up tonight and say, Pastor, that's where I'm at. I'm not sure, but I'd like to be. Pray for